Chapter 4 Tissues In today's lecture, we'll talk a little bit about cancer. We like to know a little bit about the cell type that's a tumor before we decide upon a treatment. Historically, this was done using microscopes. You will be doing this in lab. In the future, though, it'll probably be done a lot more with genetic analysis. So I hope you've taken a genetics class. We'll also talk about tissue scaffolds. These are things that can be used instead of organ transplants or tissue grafts. We'll talk about chondroitin sulfate and why some people may take that as a supplement. We'll talk about cartilage and tendons and why injuries to these tissues can often be very difficult to repair or heal. We'll talk about scurvy and its link to vitamin C. And lastly, we'll talk about inflammation. This will be the big concept of the chapter because it's going to be involved in nearly every infection and trauma that you treat. So today we're learning about the four main types of tissue, epithelia, muscle, nervous, and connective tissue. And we need to learn some basic elements about each of these. This lecture would kind of be like going to an art class and having an entire day spent on the color blue. That would be a pretty boring lecture. Tissues are kind of like different colors. They can be used in many different paintings. And that's what we need to learn about today. What are some of the similar colors that we will see throughout the human body? So an epithelial cell, for instance, when it divides, it tends to give rise to more epithelial cells and they stick together forming a tissue. A tissue is one type of cell in a group working together to form a common purpose. Not every one of these epithelial cells has to be identical, but they're all epithelial cells. A different tissue down below might be a connective tissue made by a different cell type called a fibroblast. This tissue even looks different because there aren't nearly as many cells as the first one. These two tissues together can form an organ. And in chapter five, we'll cover our first organ, which is the skin. So a tissue is a group of cells, all the same cell type working together to serve a common function. We'll be working our way up to discussing organs, which are made of at least two different tissue types. Once we learn about how these tissues behave, we won't have to learn it over and over and over again. We'll be seeing the same patterns throughout the year. The way that tissues are classified in our textbook and every anatomy textbook is based off of the historical way. A snapshot was taken of all of the different tissues. People looked at them and lumped them into groups based off of how they looked. And that is how we came up with the four main tissue types. For instance, if I looked at these six people, I might decide that they were in two major families, the blonde haired family and the brown haired family. It would of course be a lot more accurate if we had access to a family tree. For instance, it might be three families represented in this group rather than two. Unfortunately, this is not the way that we are going to classify tissues. We could, but for the past hundred years, we've been doing it the previous way, not this more accurate way. So be prepared for a little bit of weirdness. The best way to classify tissues would have been to look at a family tree. And in an organism, instead of calling it a family tree, we would call this cell lineages. Initially, all the cells are exactly the same but then some of them migrate to the inside of us. So we have an inner and an outer layer of cells. And then some of them migrate between these two layers, giving us three basic cell types, ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. All of our tissue types are derived from these three families of cells. And this would have been the best way to classify tissues. But instead of these three families, we're going to break them up into four families of tissues 
based off of how they look as adult cells. And those four are epithelia, connective tissue, muscle, and nervous tissue. Today we'll focus heavily on epithelia and connective. We'll get to chapter 10 later this term and cover muscle tissue in great depth, and next quarter is when we'll cover nervous tissue in greater depth. Here are two basic patterns that we're going to see when we look under the microscope. First off, our cells are not going to look uniform like these weird tube eggs here. Instead, we're going to see different slices through an egg. Sometimes we'll get the yolk, sometimes we won't. If you don't see that thing in the center, don't believe that a cell is lacking a nucleus. We've just sliced off to the edge and haven't gotten it. Over to the right here, we see a bunch of different circles. And one thing you're going to have to imagine is that all of these circles are connected to one another in a long squiggly tube. And since we've taken a thin slice through that squiggly tube, it appears as a bunch of individual circles. So, under the microscope, this is what we might see. There's a cell roughly here, but I can't really see its nucleus. It definitely has one, we just didn't slice through the right section. And over here, on the right-hand side, we see a bunch of tubes all of these tubes would be connected to one another. I can't be sure, but that's a pretty safe assumption. So our first tissue type are epithelia, which are a sheet of cells that cover things, forming a barrier from one side of the body to the other. There are also glandular epithelia that we'll be covering at the end of this section. To maintain a sheet, these epithelial cells will need to be anchored to one another, and to make sure nothing gets between the cells, we'll have those tight junctions that we talked about in the previous chapter. These epithelial cells will have polarity. Polarity just means different sides, like the North Pole and the South Pole are different. One of them has penguins, the other has Santa Claus. Epithelial cells will have an apical surface and a basolateral surface. They also have planar polarity, which I'll show you a picture of because it's easier to show than to describe. Epithelia will always be on top of connective tissue. That should help you to identify them. They are typically avascular, which means they do not have their own blood supply. And instead, they're going to have to rely on diffusion of nutrients from below. Because diffusion is not very fast, this is going to mean that epithelia are always going to be very thin. One thing that epithelia can do really well, however, is regenerate. When they get damaged, they can repair that damage quickly and on their own without requiring stem cells. This is going to be different from many other tissues in the body. So, the basic type of epithelia are the ones that form layers. There are also glandular epithelia, and we'll get to those after we get through the easy ones. Most epithelial tissues form a barrier, and they can do one of three things. Many epithelia are good at moving fluids over the epithelium. For instance, the epithelia in my respiratory tract can move mucus, which has trapped pathogens that I inhaled, up and out of my body. Some epithelia are good at moving materials through the barrier. For instance, the epithelia in my digestive tract are good at absorbing certain nutrients, but keeping other things out. Lastly, a number of epithelia can make secretions. Both my respiratory tract and digestive tract make mucus for protection. Epithelia have polarity, meaning they have different sides. And rather than saying the top and the bottom, we say apical and basolateral. 
We have to say this because epithelia aren't always oriented upright, if you will. The apical surface is always the free surface, whereas the basolateral surface is always attached to a deeper tissue. To maintain the sheet, we're going to need to make sure that cells are anchored to one another and that there are no gaps. So we're going to have a few different intercellular connections. We'll talk about the basement membrane and we'll talk about cell division. Without these three things, I just have a bunch of cells, not an organized barrier. So first off, epithelial cells can anchor themselves to other epithelial cells thanks to cell adhesion molecules, or CAMs. There are a number of different CAMs throughout the human body. Each tissue type typically has its own CAM. That means the cells of that tissue stick to other cells in that tissue rather than different cell types. For instance, these epithelial cells would not stick well to muscle cells, only to other epithelial cells. Next up are the cell junctions that we discussed in the previous chapter. Especially the tight junctions and anchoring junctions are going to be very important for epithelial cells. Tight junctions make sure that epithelia form a water impermeable barrier from one surface to the other surface. And the anchoring junctions make sure that the epithelial cells are strongly attached to one another. So in my digestive tract, the epithelium forms a barrier. It is able to move some substances across the epithelium, but others stay in the lumen of my digestive tract. This requires energy, and I've set up a couple concentration gradients now that I would like to maintain. And tight junctions make sure that the nutrients that I just pumped don't diffuse back out of my blood and toxins don't diffuse into my blood. Without those tight junctions, I'd have gaps between cells and things would just move down their concentration gradient in ways that I don't want. We also discussed in the previous chapter that these transport proteins can also diffuse as part of the fluid mosaic model of the plasma membrane. And that's another thing that tight junctions prevent. This is what keeps these cells polarized. Now the name basolateral comes about because the tight junctions are really just up here towards the top or the apical surface. They form the barrier between two sides. Any protein that you found on the lateral surfaces could just as easily be found down here on the basal surface. So we say basolateral for down below the tight junctions and apical for up above here. Next up, the anchoring junctions make sure that the epithelial cells stay anchored to one another. They come in two basic flavors. There can be spot desmosomes between two cells or hemidesmosomes anchoring these cells down to the connective tissue below. The connective tissue below is called the basement membrane. You may see it referred to as a few other names. It doesn't really matter. But there's a thin layer of connective tissue anchoring these cells down so that they don't move around. Next up, if there's any damage to an epithelium, it repairs the damage very quickly. That's because epithelial cells are highly capable of undergoing mitosis. They will do so when they are not being inhibited by neighboring cells. So when there is damage, these inhibitions are taken away and the epithelial cells at the borders can start undergoing mitosis. This will continue until all of the cells are touching other cells. The damage has been repaired and we do not continue to grow. Last up, we talked about the apical and basolateral polarity, which we can think of as the top and the bottom. Epithelial cells also have planar polarity. That means 
we're talking about what direction this little spiky hair is pointing. And as you can see in this picture over here, they're all pointing in the same direction. All of these cells are communicating with one another so that they know what direction that they are facing. So those were some of the basic features about epithelia. Next up, let's go and discuss some of the specific epithelia that you'll be identifying in lab. So we're going to talk about different classes of epithelia, and we like to break them up into big groups so that we don't have to do this, discuss all of the different epithelial tissues individually, because there's epithelia all over the place. So we're going to classify epithelia based on their shape, and we'll pick one of these three words over here, and then we'll classify them based on how many layers they have, one or more than one. So we'll have to pick one of these two words over here as well, and that will give us the full name. Let's start with shape. A cell that is roughly as tall as it is wide is called cuboidal. If they are taller, we call them columnar, and if they're flat, we call them squamous. This would be a simple cuboidal epithelium here. It is a single sheet. Just like if you took one piece of paper and rolled it up into a tube, it's still just one piece of paper. You'd only have to go through one layer to get from the inside here to the outside. A stratified epithelium, on the other hand, is more than one from the inside to the outside, you'd have to go through multiple cells. So let's start with our simple ones. Simple squamous epithelia are flat and a very thin membrane. There are two simple squamous epithelia that we'll be talking about this year that get special names. The mesothelium, which we'll discuss this term, and endothelium, which we will discuss next term. For now, I think it's good enough just to know a simple squamous epithelium when you see one. It's fairly easy to identify these if you're looking at them from the side view, because they're nice and skinny here. If you were looking at them from the top view, it would be really hard to tell that these cells were flat and skinny. These will sometimes form tubes, and depending on where the tube is sliced, it'll look different. I'll have cells on the tops and the sides. If I sliced right down the middle, these simple squamous epithelial cells would definitely look squamous. But if I cut down the side of the tube, I might not realize what types of cells these are, even though they are the flat, simple squamous epithelial cells, just like the ones we saw before. If I cut this tube crosswise, once again, I think it would be pretty easy to identify these as simple squamous epithelial cells. The hints can be looking for the nuclei. That should give you a rough estimate of how big these cells are and where they're located. The stratified squamous epithelium is shown here, all the way from here to here. It's definitely more than one cell layer thick. In this one, this is a very common stratified squamous epithelium found in the skin, you'll notice that the surface layer, the apical surface, all of the cells here look pretty dead. We'll see two basic types of stratified squamous epithelia. On the surface of my body, we find keratinized ones where the cells at the surface are dead. Inside my body, I can find non-keratinized ones. For instance, inside my mouth, these stratified squamous epithelia should be moist at their surface because all of the cells are still alive. Next up are the cuboidal epithelia. Over here, we see a simple cuboidal epithelium. There's one of those cells. Down below, this is a very rare stratified cuboidal epithelium. These are difficult to find under the microscope. It's possible, but it takes a lot of hunting. 
Next up, this is one of the exceptions to our rule called transitional epithelium. You'll notice some of the cells down here look kind of smallish, but then the cells up here seem to be bigger. This tissue type can stretch, and when it does, the cells change their shape. We find it in the bladder and a few of the tubes connected to the bladder, and that's about it. And these tubes and the bladder are special that they need to stretch significantly when they're full of urine and then collapse back down to a smaller size when it's empty. So the textbook says looking at a transitional epithelium should look for the apical cells looking larger than the basolateral cells. I think it's easier to identify this tissue if you just zoom way out. It should look like a wrinkled up bedsheet cut in cross section. Next up are the columnar epithelium. You'll probably only see a simple columnar epithelium. These cells are very long and skinny. Now it is getting pretty messy here. It's almost impossible to slice through just one cell thick layers when using razor blades. So you kind of have to scan through this tissue to find a cleaner region before you're going to correctly identify this as a simple columnar epithelium. This one, there are no regions that look clean. This is another exception to our rule, and we call this one pseudostratified columnar epithelium. It's definitely more than one cell thick to get from here to here, but looks like I had to go through two cells there. I had to go through three or four cells over here. So I can't clearly identify the number of layers other than it's more than one. This is going to be difficult to spell on a test. I suggest breaking it up into smaller bits. So this tissue type are columnar cells that aren't organized up and down. And when they get layered on top of each other, you'll notice that some of them get mostly hidden. So it's messy. We're not organized into layers, but it does have this hint of being more than just a simple epithelium. So we had simple squamous, simple cuboidal, simple columnar, and then that weird pseudostratified columnar. We had stratified squamous, which is very easy to find. Stratified cuboidal and stratified columnar are very difficult to find. And transitional epithelium, easy to find if you know where to look, which is the bladder. So those are the basic types of epithelia. Next up, let's talk about glands. Glands are also made of epithelial cells. There are a number of different ways in which we can classify glands. I have them listed here in order of importance. At the top are the secretion targets, either exocrine or endocrine glands. Next up, how the glands secrete. Next, what types of secretions they make. And lastly, what do the glands look like? The most important, at least to me, is the difference between endocrine and exocrine glands. Endocrine glands release substances into the body, either into the bloodstream or interstitial fluid. Exocrine glands secrete substances to the surface of the body through a duct. So structurally, the exocrine glands look different than the endocrine because of the existence of this duct. Remember, the surface of the body can either mean the outer surface, like in my skin, or the inner surfaces. When my stomach secretes hydrochloric acid and digestive enzymes, that's to the inner surface of my body. Next up are how the cells secrete their substances. Merocrine secretion involves packaging up substances into vesicles and then releasing them via exocytosis at the apical surface of the cell. Next is apocrine secretion, 
where all of those vesicles are sent to the apical side of the cell, and part of that cell pinches off and explodes, releasing all of those substances at once. And lastly is holocrine secretion, where the cell just fills up with what, whatever substance it's making and explodes. Now this may seem wasteful, like you're just wasting a cell, but that's okay. I can make epithelial cells really easily. In fact, the lifespan of the epithelial cells in my gums is just a couple of days. Then they need to be replaced anyway. So losing a few cells in a gland is really no big deal. Next up, we could talk about the shape of these glands. There's one unicellular gland in the human body that I know of called a goblet cell. And these are very important and produce mucus. What you might notice here in this cartoon is there's a whole lot of rough endoplasmic reticulum and Golgi apparatus. And that's because this cell has just one function, which is to secrete glycoproteins that attract water and become mucus. You find these throughout the respiratory tract, digestive tract, reproductive tracts, and probably a few other tracts whose names I've forgotten at the moment. The goblet cells are usually embedded in a pseudostratified or a simple columnar epithelium. They'll usually look different. They won't have cilia or microvilli the way that the other epithelial cells do. All of the other glands are multicellular, meaning they're made from more than one epithelial cell. They could be simple, meaning they've just got one tube. They could have more than one tube. Those tubes could branch. The tubes could dead end in little circular pockets, or they could dead end in these more tubular pockets. So these are ways of classifying glands based off of their shape. That's nice. Historically, anatomists loved making lists about the shapes of things. Unfortunately, this does not tell us about what these different types of glands do. With one exception, they've all got ducts, therefore they are all exocrine glands. We might look at different tissue types under the microscope when trying to treat people with cancer based on how the cells look, can tell us a little bit about how they might respond to different types of chemotherapeutic agents. Here are a few examples of different types of breast cancers. You can see over here that these breast cancers are still forming these hollow tubes. They sort of have duct-like appearances, so they haven't completely forgotten what type of cell they are. Whereas over here, these tumors over here are totally nuts these would be much more difficult to treat. In the future though, and really right now, a better way to try and determine how to treat cancers is not by how the cells appear, but what genes have been mutated leading to the cancer. This will tell us a lot more about how those cells will respond to different types of drugs. So, you should really be taking a genetics class at some point and learning a little bit about genomics or the identification of every gene within the cell and looking for small mutations called SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms. This is what a genomic analysis of a tumor looks like. Each of these red lines indicates a gene that is expressed in that cell and we can see which of those are different from what we've identified as healthy in the Human Genome Project. For instance, if the HER2 gene has been mutated, an estrogen receptor, then treating this tumor with a drug that blocks estrogen signaling isn't really going to do much at all. The cell lacks the receptor that would have made it sensitive to that drug in the first place. So those were the glands, and that wraps up the epithelial tissues. Next, let's talk about muscle tissue. There's three basic types of muscle tissue. For right now, you just need to worry about identifying these. There is skeletal muscle, where the cells are really long and have a striped appearance. 
This is our textbook picture. There are better pictures available to you in the lab reference. Smooth muscle does not have a striped appearance. Lastly, cardiac muscle does have a striped appearance, but the cells are much smaller than in skeletal muscle. For instance, here might be one cardiac muscle cell right here, whereas this skeletal muscle cell over here doesn't even fit on the picture. It's extending off the edges. Neural tissue is our third main tissue type, and it involves a few neurons that we can see here. These cells often have really long extensions called axons. And then the rest of this gunk are glia, which are very fascinating, although not that interesting to look at under the microscope. We'll be talking about neural tissue in much greater depth in BI-232. For right now, make sure that you can identify the two major cell types in this tissue, the neurons and the glia. Honestly, you can say neuroglia, although it's a little bit redundant. Glia is just fine. So those are three of our major tissue types. That's just going to lead us to connective tissue. Now, anatomists love making lists, and they have classified connective tissues into four different types. The only words in red here that we're ever going to say is this one here, dense. So we can pretty much ignore loose, supportive, and fluid, and focus on the individual connective tissue types in these categories. Connective tissues do exactly what they say. They connect one thing to another thing. They can be very structural, like bone and ligaments. Some connective tissues are good at storing energy, like adipose tissue. Some connective tissues connect very distant parts of the body, transporting nutrients, like blood. You cannot see any connective tissues at the surface of the human body. Or at least, I should say, you can't touch any. If you look through somebody's cornea, you can see some connective tissue back there in the iris. But everything at the surface of the body is an epithelial tissue even the enamel of people's teeth. That's made by an epithelium. All connective tissues are made of both some cells and then a lot of extracellular matrix, which just means there's a bunch of stuff outside of the cells. So what do we find outside of the cells? We can find fibers and gooey stuff called ground substance. So when you're looking at this picture over here, most of what we're looking at is extracellular matrix, probably a whole lot of protein fibers in this case. Our textbook talks about a number of different cell types found in a connective tissue. We'll focus on just the most important ones, and those are fibroblasts. They are the ones that secrete all of the extracellular matrix, hence their name. They make all of the fibers as well as the ground substance. Technically, a mature fibroblast is called a fibrocyte, although we typically never use this word. We'll see a bunch of adipocytes in adipose tissue, so those will be important. The mesenchymal stem cells are functionally absolutely important. These give rise to all of the other cell types that you find here as well as cell types on other pages today, as well as cell types in tissues that we've already covered. Melanocytes will be important in the next chapter, so let's skip over those. And white blood cells are very important, but we won't be talking about those until BI-232. So we're going to be focusing on the fibroblasts and we'll also mention mesenchymal stem cells a number of times. The fibroblasts make all of the extracellular matrix, which includes both fibers and ground substance. There are three basic types of protein fibers. The first are the collagen fibers, which are really strong protein fibers. These are large and easy to spot under the microscope. 
reticular fibers are actually made of collagen. But historically, because somebody could see them under the microscope, they were called their own individual fiber type. These form more of a network or a spider web like shape that helps to support cells. They're not very strong, but they can suspend cells in a 3D web. The last are the elastic fibers. These are a different protein. This protein is really good at stretching and then bouncing back to its original shape. So anywhere where you need elasticity, you will have a lot of elastic fibers, like in your ears or even in the ligaments in your spine. Next up, fibroblasts secrete a bunch of gooey stuff called ground substance. Ground substance is a gelatinous material, similar to jello, that's good at absorbing shock and preventing the movement of nasty things like viruses and bacteria through the spaces. Ground substance is made of different glycoproteins. These are really long proteins that may or may not have sugars attached to them. These include the glycosaminoglycans, one of which is called chondroitin sulfate. Others get called proteoglycans. And the most important is the fibronectin family. For right now, these large glycoproteins absorb and retain water. Jello is really just dehydrated glycoproteins. It's ground substance from an animal that's had all the water removed. When you add water to it, the water stays put, it gels up. And that's exactly what happens in the human body. If somebody was taking a chondroitin sulfate supplement, they might be trying to provide their body with the raw materials for making new connective tissues. For instance, if they had injured the cartilage of their knee. If you want to know more about the proteins found in extracellular matrix, I have made this little video on YouTube about how these proteins can be used in complicated surgeries. Uh, one example is called fibrin sealant, which is already in use. Going through testing right now are collagen-like polymers, which are being used to replace tissue grafts, or parts of the body taken from cadavers and sewn into living patients. These collagen-like polymers have the bonus of not coming from dead people, therefore transmission of disease or rejection by the immune system is negligible, and they should also be a lot cheaper. Collagen is one of our most important connective tissue fibers. In order to make collagen, that requires vitamin C. The vitamin C doesn't become collagen, it's just a cofactor. Without collagen, people's skin becomes weak and prone to forming open sores. Bones also become weak, blood vessels become weak and are prone to bleeding, and the central nervous system also has problems as well. The ancient Egyptians understood that their sailors needed adequate vitamin C in order to prevent the disease scurvy. This wasn't discovered by Westerners until much, much later uh, in the 18th century. But an experiment performed by James Lind defined that scurvy could be prevented by citrus fruits, not from any of these other substances. Linus Pauling, a very famous Oregon scientist, one of the few people to have won two Nobel Prizes in their lifetime, went on after winning two Nobel Prizes to tout the benefits of taking huge doses of vitamin C. He thought that it would cure cancer. Unfortunately for him, it does not, for both he and his wife died of cancer despite their really large vitamin C regimen. Apparently, it was very difficult for doctors at the time to argue against this advice, considering it came from a man who had won two Nobel Prizes. The problem was it just wasn't backed up by good science. I bring this up here because this has a local flavor to the area, 
as Linus Pauling is from Oregon, uh, but also to show that sometimes really smart people get led down the wrong path. We are all subject to our own biases, and those biases can lead us very far astray. So it's important to me to look at the evidence, to look at the science, and to ask whether the science is biased or not. So that's what we find in connective tissue. We do find a few cells, but it's mostly extracellular matrix, including fibers and ground substance. Next up, let's talk about the different types of connective tissue. Again, we're going to ignore most of these words in red and focus on just the main connective tissue types. First off, we can define connective tissues as being either loose or dense. And when we use these words, we're talking about the number of fibers versus the amount of ground substance. The looser connective tissues have a lot more of this gooey ground substance, whereas dense regular and dense irregular connective tissue are mostly collagen fibers. Hence, they look denser under the microscope and they behave differently. They are much stronger than the other connective tissues. So our first connective tissue is the most generic. It's called areolar connective tissue. We find this throughout the body where you just need to connect one thing to another thing, especially in places where you might want to leave some space for capillaries or other blood vessels. Next up is adipose connective tissue. This connective tissue is unique in that it doesn't have a lot of extracellular matrix. It's mostly cells. Based off of its lineage though, it's definitely a connective tissue. Shown here is what is called white fat. This is the type of adipose tissue you will find in an adult human. It's good at storing energy and also at absorbing shock and insulating. Now a little bit of terminology. The word fat can mean a lot of different things. For instance, I don't want you saying that fat is full of fat cells, which are full of fat. This tissue is called adipose tissue. The cell type are adipocytes, and the molecule that they are full of are triglycerides. So from here on out, don't use the word fat. We need to be more specific and accurate. Adipocytes do not divide. Luckily for adipose tissue, there's always plenty of mesenchymal stem cells that can migrate into this tissue. They divide, and some of those will differentiate into new adipocytes. This is what happens when we need to store more adipose tissue. When the adipose tissue shrinks, the triglycerides can be burned for fuel, but the adipocytes, even if they're no longer needed, do not go away. They simply shrink. It's going to be a lot easier to fill them back up again if you eat excessive calories. Brown adipose tissue is one that we're not going to see in lab. That's because adult humans have very little brown adipose tissue. In fact, 10 years ago, we thought it was none. But now with better imaging techniques, we know it's a little bit. The exact functional importance of brown adipose tissue in an adult is still under debate, but we know what it does in mice and in newborns, and that is this type of tissue can burn triglycerides to release heat. Babies don't shiver. This is the only way they can generate body heat. Next up, this page here shows that adipose tissue and simple squamous epithelial tissue look a little bit alike under the microscope, depending on how zoomed in you are. The trick is to try and identify individual cells. I have two cells highlighted here in the dashed lines in either image. If this is not clear to you, that just means you need some more practice, and that's okay. Next up, reticular connective tissue. It's going to have a lot of these round blood cells in it, but then all of these weird squiggly fibers. These squiggly fibers are the reticular fibers that we talked about earlier. 
This type of tissue is found in places where blood just needs to hang out for a bit, like the spleen or in lymph nodes. I don't want all of the blood cells falling to the bottom of my spleen and all of the plasma floating up to the top, so I've provided all of these cells with these little hammocks here in the form of reticular connective tissue so that blood cells are found throughout the organ. Next up are the dense connective tissues, primarily dense regular and dense irregular connective tissue. If you have to identify elastic tissue, that is something that your lab instructor will have you do. Dense regular connective tissue is composed primarily of collagen fibers running parallel. Because it's mostly collagen, this makes this tissue very strong. And because the fibers are parallel, it makes this tissue very strong in one direction. That is good if you're a tendon or a ligament. You can resist a lot of tension in one direction. Of course, if you put some force on your anterior cruciate ligament in the wrong direction, it tends to snap. In addition to the collagen fibers, are the fibroblasts. Here I can just make out their nucleuses. I'm not sure where the rest of the cell begins and ends. And that's because this pink stain has stained all of the proteins. I'm seeing a lot of collagen, but then all of the proteins inside the cytoplasm of this fibroblast are also pink. So I'm seeing pink on pink. So this type of tissue has collagen fibers running in parallel. Dense irregular connective tissue has collagen fibers running in every which direction. You find this tissue in places where you need to resist force in multiple directions, such as in the skin or around many of your organs. So let's review which of these do you think are different types of connective tissue. If you said A was, you would have been correct. That's one that I didn't go over. I think letter C is next. That's actually skeletal muscle. Next up, what about B? That's actually smooth muscle. And lastly, D, that's actually dense regular connective tissue. Before I move on, you may ask, why does it look so squiggly? And that's because when I was cutting through this with a razor blade, I was slicing back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and wound up pushing and pulling the parallel collagen fibers a little bit helter skelter, giving it this squiggly appearance. That's what's known as an artifact. It would not look like this in the human body. We caused that appearance. So those are the basic connective tissue types areolar, adipose, reticular, dense regular, dense irregular. We've got a couple weird ones to go over, so let's do those last. But just to review, a connective tissue has some cells, mostly fibroblasts, and they make a bunch of different types of fibers, including the big collagen fibers, the smaller reticular fibers, and then some elastic fibers, and then the rest of the stuff is ground substance made of those glycoproteins that attract water to form a gel. The other connective tissues have all of these same substances. They just might not be so obvious. Blood has a number of cells, primarily red blood cells and a few white blood cells. The extracellular matrix is mostly plasma but there's even some fibers in there. Right now they're soluble so that you can't see them, but when they solidify to form fibrin, that's when blood starts to clot. Lymph is another fluid connective tissue. We're not going to be looking at this one under the microscope. We'll have a ginormous chapter on this tissue in BI-232. The last two are cartilage and bone. These sometimes get called the supportive connective tissues because they help to support the human body. Cartilage, the primary cell type here, are called chondrocytes. 
these secreted this extracellular matrix, which is mostly ground substance. A bunch of proteoglycans absorb water, forming a very dense gel. This gel is slippery, but also very good at absorbing shock. One thing that makes cartilage tissue different from the other connective tissues is that it is avascular. For this reason, it has a very difficult time healing. That's why our patient might be taking a chondroitin sulfate supplement. That's one of the major molecules found in the ground substance. The data on whether that actually works for cartilage is less than overwhelming. Surrounding the cartilage tissue would be a layer of more fibrous connective tissue called the perichondrium. There are three basic types of cartilage. The most abundant type is hyaline cartilage. We can also find a stronger type called fibrocartilage in a few places. And lastly, a few parts of the body have elastic cartilage, namely my ears and my epiglottis. This type of cartilage is good at changing shape and snapping back to its original position. Osseous tissue, or for those into the whole brevity thing, bone tissue, is very strong and resistant to extreme amounts of force. The primary cell type found in adult bone is called the osteocyte. There will be a few others that we'll cover in chapter seven. So those are the connective tissues. The last thing that we have to cover in this chapter is inflammation. Whenever a tissue is injured, it'll go through a very rapid process called inflammation. This will happen within seconds. Weeks to months later, the tissue will begin regenerating. We'll talk more about regeneration in the next chapter. So right now we're going to focus on the very fast response to tissue damage, which is inflammation. There are four hallmark symptoms to inflammation, swelling, redness, heat, and pain. These will happen anytime there is an infection or anytime the body experiences some form of trauma or physical injury. You not only need to be able to recite the four hallmark symptoms, we need to understand what causes them and why. So here in a basic tissue, let's do some damage. Let's say some of these cells get infected with a virus and start killing those cells. So everything that used to be inside of the cell is now outside, including the lysosomes. So we've just dumped a bunch of hydrochloric acid onto these neighboring cells. That could kill them. And then they would release hydrochloric acid onto their neighbors. If this wasn't stopped, this tissue damage would spread. And when that happens, we call it necrosis. This is what inflammation prevents. We're going to stop the spread of tissue damage and set the stage to repair the damage. So damaged cells not only release their lysosomes, they release a bunch of inflammatory molecules. Some of these molecules were just in the cytoplasm minding their own business, like prostaglandins and ATP. But when these things are released, they take on a different role, which is to signal to nearby cells that there is tissue damage. Nearby blood vessels will dilate, bringing in more blood to this area. That's going to be useful because it'll bring more nutrients to this area, which we're going to need in order to repair the damage. It'll also bring in more white blood cells, which will release more inflammatory molecules which cause the blood vessels to become permeable, and a bunch of fluid will now seep into this area. This area will now be swollen and red. These, this extra fluid is going to be useful, again, because it contains nutrients, but we've also now put pressure on the area, and that's going to block the spread of lysosomal acids and block the spread of viruses trying to move and infect new cells. So this redness and swelling is blocking necrosis, as well as limiting the spread of the original damage. More white blood cells will be attracted to the inflammatory molecules. 
they can clean up any debris, destroying any viruses or bacteria, and that will set the stage for regeneration. Lastly, I did not mention heat and pain. This increased blood flow to the area warms up the region. The increased temperature will speed up enzymatic reactions, such as in the repair process. And the inflammatory molecules can also bind to pain receptors, triggering pain. And this will keep us from re-injuring the area. We will take it easy, allowing the tissues a chance to repair the damage. So in the next few slides, I have the textbook pictures and everything that I said typed out in words. The first step is the release of inflammatory molecules. I used this one as one of my main examples, prostaglandins. This is a pretty important word to learn because it's the production of prostaglandins that's inhibited by the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, or NSAIDs, like aspirin and Tylenol and ibuprofen. So this is a pretty important word. One of the other ones was ATP. This is an inflammatory molecule. Of course, when it's in our cells, we use it for energy, but when it's outside of our cells, now it serves a different purpose. The same way that my blood does. When it's in my body, it's moving nutrients from one place to another. But when it's outside of my body, it's signaling to other people that I'm in trouble and I need help. So we need to trigger inflammation to make sure that necrosis doesn't spread. We do this by releasing inflammatory molecules, which can attract white blood cells, which release more inflammatory molecules. Hey, there's a positive feedback loop that we talked about in chapter one. Some of these inflammatory molecules cause pain, which is useful to us because it tells us to take it easy on this area until it has a chance to be repaired. Inflammatory molecules also lead to the dilation of blood vessels and increased permeability so that more fluid flows into the area, causing redness and swelling. This also brings in more white blood cells, which can clean up the debris. And lastly, this will give us a chance to regenerate the damage. Some tissues, like epithelia, are really good at regenerating. It takes time. A small cut may take weeks to heal. So this regeneration phase is on a totally different time scale from inflammation. Inflammation is triggered right away. This takes longer. It would especially take longer if it's a much larger injury. I may have to wait for stem cells to migrate into the area and divide to give me the cells that I need. If it were a really large injury, I may not be able to wait for cells at all, and I just fill in the gap with collagen. This would be a scar, and the cells that make collagen are, of course, the fibroblasts. I might be able to replace some of the scar tissue with the tissue that I had initially, but if I didn't, I would be left over with a visible scar. And we'll talk about visible scars in the chapter on skin coming up next. So the stem cells that migrate into the area are called mesenchymal stem cells. They can move into this area and differentiate into whatever cell type that you need, or almost any cell type that you need. For instance, they can turn into fibroblasts and lay down some scar tissue. Not all cell types are capable of regenerating. For instance, mesenchymal stem cells don't turn into neurons or muscle tissue very well, and therefore damage to the heart or to the brain is very difficult to repair. Lastly, a few more bits of terminology. Atrophy would be the shrinking of a tissue, not damage to the tissue. Necrosis is damage to a tissue that spreads. Usually this is spreading because of a lack of oxygen. Lastly, we'll talk about this more in, throughout the year, which is apoptosis. This is different from necrosis. This is programmed cell death. Sometimes cells know that they're not going to survive, and rather than explode and release their lysosomes onto their neighbors, 
they will go through programmed cell death or apoptosis and die in a very organized and safe fashion. So those are the four hallmarks of inflammation. Make sure you understand what causes them and why they are useful. Later, we can talk about why too much inflammation can actually be bad and why we might need to inhibit it. But for now, let's start with why it's good. Without inflammation, every injury would become necrotic.